Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Spotlight Talk today. I'm just going to give a moment for everybody's audio and everything to get connected. It's nice to see so many familiar faces with us. <laughs> so um, my name is Katie Wynn. I'm the Communications and Public Programs Director here at the museum. Um, so excited for today's talk because we are turning uh, the microphone over to Erin Palmer, who was our archives fellow um, funded by a grant from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage this, um, this fall. Over the course of 10 weeks, Erin helped us really just get an understanding of what was in the archival materials that we had found um, last year. And so we're so grateful for the work that she did. It allows us um, to just dig into so much new material. Um, I'm also so grateful that you're taking the time um, because your fellowship has ended and you're coming back just to do this um, for the, the fun of it and um, for the benefit of everyone who's tuning in today. Uh, so before I turn it over to Aaron, just some very quick housekeeping notes. Um, I would ask that everyone just keep yourselves on mute during the course of Aaron's talk. And then at the end, we can open it up for questions. Um, if you do think of any questions while the talk is going on and you wanna jot those down into the chat, um, either Larissa who's on the line also, or one of the other co WEM colleagues on the call can kind of address those as we go, or if it makes more sense to wait till Aaron's uh, finished, we'll get to those questions at the end. So, so either way is fine there. And otherwise, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Aaron. You can share your screen and, and we'll get started. Thanks sure. so much. Sure. Um, hi everyone, my name is Erin Palmer, like Katie said, um, Archives Fellow in the fall of 2022, uh, working on the new collection. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and give my little presentation on what the collection was, what was in it, um, as well as some fun little some highlights. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Here is our presentation. Okay, and can everybody see that, Katie? Are we, we're good? Okay, cool. So. The Warren Ashraga Mansfield Baskin Collection is what I've called it. Um, it consisted of lots of fun stuff, some correspondence, um, some ephemera um, of the latter half of Warren Ashraga's life. Um, as Katie said, I was brought on as the, fel as the archives fellow to kind of go through the materials, survey, process, arrange, describe, basically organize a big box of stuff into something that's usable uh, for the staff and for researchers in the future. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to kind of go through what my archival process was, um, as well as some some fun little gems I found within the collection. Okay. So the start of the collection um, in September of 2022, it was kind of three really large file boxes of stuff. Um, the good news was there was some organization. Um, there were folders with titles, um, which is more than you see in some archival collection, sometimes you start and it's just a bunch of papers. <laughs> um, so we're really happy to see some some organization. Um, and it appeared to be divided into to two uh, halves, one being materials collected by Warren Ashrick and uh, the other half being materials collected by Bob Bascom. Um, the front half had an alphabetical arrangement, which was really awesome, um, usually uh, organized by, by subject, um, A to Z, um, but it wasn't necessarily super accessible because there'd be some inconsistencies um, with the correspondence. Sometimes, for example, there'd be individuals under A that had no A in their name, but they were an architect, so they were under A. Uh, so that's not great for, for findability if you're looking for a specific piece of paper, correspondence, invoice about a person. Um, you want to have as little access points as possible so you're able to find those materials. Um, but like I said, there was an organization to go off of, so that was pretty pretty fortunate. Um, and then later files didn't really have much of an organization. They were in folders. Folders were labeled most of the time, um, but there really wasn't a rhyme or reason as to why those things were separated. So that kind of took me a second to figure out what I was looking at. So that kind of takes us into the process of uh, surveying. Um, so basically I needed to address a couple of questions. One being, what are the materials in the collection? Um, and I kind of figured out pretty soon there were five types of materials. Uh, correspondence, um, a lot of these letters were from Morton, um, but also Miriam Phillips, 
Um, they were to clients and friends. Um, they were of per personal nature as well as professional nature. Um, and oftentimes the letters themselves would kind of bounce in back and forth between tone. You know, uh, Wharton asking about the design of a furniture piece, uh, but then asking about that person's Christmas. Um, so it was, it was kind of fun to see the bulk of uh, the, the bulk of the, the subject matter within the correspondence. That was probably the best part of the collection. Um, there are also photographs, oftentimes with the correspondence. Um, maybe they were writing about, this is where I want to put this desk in my house. And then there was a photograph of their living room space. Um, but also there were their personal photos, a Christmas card with, with a family on it saying, you know, Merry Christmas to Wharton. Um, there was professional paperwork. This included invoices, contract agreements, um, agreements between galleries about exhibitions, that sort of thing. Um, and then there were newspaper clippings. These were largely with the materials collected by Bob Bascom. Um, and they were often either about Wharton or individuals in Wharton's life, um, giving some background information regarding their life, their death, you know, things that had happened to them during their life, why they were prominent, um, as well as some ephemera, which included uh, programs for exhibitions, uh, advertisements, those sort of things. So those were the types of materials. And as I was surveying, I thought to myself, other questions, um, what's the time period that we're looking at? Uh, largely, this was the 1940s to the 1960s, which is actually a pretty, pretty great find because I know that's an area that we didn't have as much information about. Um, also, what is the current system of organization? As I said, there was some alphabetizing there. Um, but after that, why, why are the materials in the folders that they are? Does it allow for findability and use of the materials? Um, and how do I go about arranging these materials in order to kind of keep as much of that original order intact while also allowing them to be useful? So then that leads us into the processing. Uh, so for the arrangement plan, I figured, and then I thought about it, and then I asked the staff if this would work for them, and we agreed on a three sub-series arrangement plan. The first being organized by um, materials collected by Warren Estrick. So these are the alphabetical files um, the, about his, you know, his business and his, his personal life. Um, and then there were two sub-series with Bob Bascom, those kind of hodgepodgey kind of files. Um, first would be materials relating to his own life, as well as the establishment of the Warren Asher Museum. Um, so those are correspondence, um, some early paperwork of the Warren Asher Museum, maybe a letter to donors, those sort of things. And then the third, which happened to be a pretty large section, um, were those kind of hodgepodge pieces where it was an article about an individual, or it was a handwritten piece of paper about um, dates about somebody's life. This I realized was um, his research for his, his biography on Warren Estrick. Um, a lot of that was him trying to figure out, put all the pieces together for his biography. There were uh, actually even parts of drafts of the manuscript for his biography in there, which was pretty cool to look at. Um, so those were the, the three sub-series we were gonna go with for the collection. Um, and then the finished collection, we went from three big boxes to 10 smaller boxes. Um, but it was actually pretty great that because I had the 10 weeks, while I wasn't able to spend as much time as I would like to, of course, we could always do more with more time. We were able to get it really, really organized into a really granular way. Um, the boxes are organized by folder and within the folder, they're, they're pretty well either alphabetized or chrono chronologically organized. Um, and they're, they're pretty easy to be able to go in and, and find what exactly you're looking for. Um, as I was going through and kind of finessing uh, Warren's alphabetizing, um, really making sure there was very minimal access points to be able to grab things. Um, I created an index to for researchers to look through and make sure that you know what they're looking for is even in the collection before they have to go digging through it, um, as well as a full finding aid as, for the collection to accompany it. So we're really we're really able to use this collection now um, for for research purposes, which is wonderful. Um, so now I'm going to kind of quick go through some highlights of the collection. Um, the most satisfying parts was reading through the letters, to be honest. Um, while I didn't have time to like really, really dig into them, sometimes there'd be little things that would stand out that would just be, you know, pretty, pretty funny, pretty humorous. I know in a original blog post a couple of months ago, um, there was a part about 
uh, warrant asking about a payment for, for a piece of furniture or a piece of sculpture. Um, and he writes, now, now, big boy, <laughs> in handwriting at the bottom of it. Um, so that's pretty funny, just, just little things here and there that you kind of smile. Um, but also observing the nature of the relationships between Warren and, and the key players. Um, oftentimes, the line between friend and patron, friend and client, was kind of blurred. A lot of times they were both. Um, and you really can see the just the number of letters between Warren and a specific person. Um, I think of the Rubensons, they're in there a lot. Um, you really can see who who were the big, the big players, the big people in his life. Um, and another person that I wanted to bring attention to is Miriam. Uh, Miriam, as we know, is Wharton's partner in the later half of his life, um, both in his personal life as well as in his business. Uh, not a formal partner, but she had a she was a big player in it. Um, and often in the correspondence, you see Miriam writing on behalf of Warren uh, to the clients. Um, and a lot of times she's in his corner, which is what I really, which is when I really began to admire her. Um, you would see sometimes, for example, if there was a discrepancy about payment, she would say something along the lines of, he doesn't pay himself a salary. You know, he pays for the materials, he pays for his workers. This is what the cost is. Um, and you need to pay for him so he can so he can make his living, but also that he can he can pay his workers. Um, and she really defends him a lot of times, um, which is where I gained a lot of respect for her. But you could also see the respect she had for him and his work, which is wonderful. Um, and on the other side of that coin, you kind of at the end there are a series of letters written from Wharton to Miriam while she's away. Um, she was an actress, so I think at this point she was in Chicago and St. Louis. Um, doing plays and he was writing to her you can really see how much he just adored her to to uh he really he really had a, a a love and respect for her um this photo i included is is a fun little part of the beginning of the letters there's a there's an image of miriam physically reading it with a caption that says uh maybe i can make that tra train columbus 57 mima mima being miriam um and then we'll kind of take a look at some of the other letters. Um, so this one on the left, had, in addition to having some fun little, some fun little doodles, which I'm, it's clearly somebody holding their head, but I'm not quite sure, you know, why he decided to write, maybe that's what he's feeling while she's gone. Um, but I think, you know, not only is he just kind of recounting the stuff that's happening while, she, while she's uh, away, kind of just giving him her, you know, filling her in on what's been happening, uh, he signs it off, you know, love, and I mean it. Love, I mean it, W. I thought that was sweet. Um, on the right, the top one, you can really see how much he's missing her. Uh, I feel a little lost now, and again, with you away, but maybe it's good discipline. Ours has been pretty rich. This gives us a chance to reflect, relive. We know, we each know the other is doing a job, what they are made for. So we count the days. Weeks, it is still, soon, days and hours. So another, a level of respect that you know, he misses her, he wishes she was here, but she's acting, that's what she's meant to do, you know, just like he's meant to be creating. Um, and, you know, when they're done with their jobs, they'll be together again. And I think that's just like a really sweet and obviously show, show, show of love, but also just a show of respect. You know, he respects her and her career, which is wonderful for the times. Um, and then the bottom one, enclose clippings, enclose love. Keep the latter, throw the former. Thought that was sweet. Throw away the clippings, but keep my love. And then the last two that I just included, um, the first one, he just starts off saying, darling, I have no ideas. I'm just going to write. And then he just fills her in on all the happenings. By the end, he just signs it. What a dull letter. Anyhow, goes with stuff and more. <laughs> like he's almost like, I don't really have much to say, but I just want to be in contact with you. And goes with stuff and more, presumably goes with love and more. Um, and then the last one to the right, this one kind of made me chuckle. His this is 1957 and he's writing of a little bit of seasonal depression. It's Christmas time, it's dark. There's not a lot of motivation. He, he wishes uh, he could be with Miriam because this time of year always gets him down. <laughs> and uh, coming out of the winter in the dark, it made me laugh because I thought, you know what? Clearly this was a thing in 1957 and it's a thing now. Um, and you could see his little drawing at the bottom, the distance between Paoli and St. Louis where she is. And he's, he's almost drawing out how far away she is and he misses her. Um, so those are just some fun letters between the two of them. And like I said, I thought 
there, I'm only touching base on a little bit of it because I didn't have time to super go into detail and look at them. But even with just a quick observation, you could really see the partnership and how much, you know, they loved each other, but they respected each other as well. You know, he respected her enough to have a piece of, of his business and also support her in her own her own uh, career, which is which is pretty wonderful. Um, so just the collection as a whole, some takeaways. Um, as we said, I know a lot of the materials at the museum pretty much reflect the early parts of Wharton's life and career as well as the middle parts, but not so much at the end. Um, while we have knowledge, obviously, of, of his later life, this really gives more, brings more to the table. He has a, a, a deeper illustration of the latter part of his life from the 1940s to his death in, the, in 1970. Um, as well as kind of the beginnings of the Wharton Ashton Museum, you see some stuff after his, after his life through Miriam, through Ruth and Bob Bascom um, in the 1970s and 1980s, where the museum starts, you know, it, it has its beginnings. Um, so that was, those are important parts of the collection. Um, in addition, just kind of going back to that examining of relationships between Warren and the people that keep popping up, um, whether that be family members, like the big three or Miriam, I always lump her in with the family, um, and Bob and Ruth Bascom as well, as well as those friends, the Rubinsons, the Cons, they keep popping up in this collection as well. Um, and you can really see how big of a part they played in, uh, in Wharton's life and business. Um, and as well, the last part, which I thought was the most important is just reading through his letters written in his own, you know, whether it be handwritten in his own hand or typed, you really can get a sense of Wharton as a person, you know, not just this prolific figure that we know and love, <laughs> um, but you could also read his thoughts, his belief, you see a sense of humor, you see what he's feeling, and you really can see Wharton as a person within this collection, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, kind of flew through that a little bit. I know I'm a couple minutes early, <laughs> um, but that's what I have with the collection. And that's the presentation. I guess I could stop sharing my screen and we could do questions. Cool. Okay, I will stop sharing. That was really wonderful, Erin. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm, I know that as a staff, we've been talking a lot lately just about really starting to appreciate just what an amazing letter writer Ashrick was and just how just how captivating it is to actually read um, pieces in his own in his own writing. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, I see one in the chat here. Um, how much archival material at the museum remains to be processed? Um, so under my knowledge, I think what we have is has been processed. I know there was a collection that was before my time that was already housed in, in, in process fully. Um, I was able to kind of write my finding aid and reflection of that finding aid to make sure we were consistent. Um, and the, the collection I processed that I thought was the only bit that was unprocessed. So I think I think everything that you guys have minus some, you know, some some um, transcripts and some some video trans or some audio transcripts. I think everything's been processed, but I might be wrong. <laughs> it looked like our curator Emily Zilber gave a thumbs up. I was, so. I was just going to chime in and say yes. Aaron's Aaron's done the the big scope of the second cache of materials, which is pretty amazing because now it's really available for research. So yep. It was a huge, huge um, help to us. Hello, it's Rob here. Hi, Hi. Make, welcome Rob. Yeah, could I make a comment relative to Miriam, please? please. Sure. Yeah. Um, when I started at the museum in January of 90, she was still living there. So during the workday, she and I shared the space. She was very protective of the space. And uh, as you know, she was an actress at Hedgerow Theater. And from Bob and Ruth, I learned how she became an actress. She lived in Philadelphia and a friend brought her out to Hedgerow to see a show. She was curious, thought she might want to try her hand at this. I understand at her first audition, they said you're a natural. So she was apparently a, a pretty prolific actress from the beginning. And uh, about in the mid nineties, she was still living there. And I remember one day I was up in the dining room area and I heard her upstairs in the third floor apartment pacing the floor. And she was obviously going through a script. She was reciting lines very, very emphatically. I mean, she was really into it. So she still around 95 was, was acting, you know. Um, 
But I did a tour one time in the 90s for a couple. And halfway through the tour, I asked them how they learned about the museum. They said, oh, we were here about 20 years ago. They said, we were here in the early 70s. And that's just a few years after Warden died. Miriam, Bob, and Ruth were the primary tour guides. And um, they said, we took this tour and this older woman was taking us through, this very small woman. And they said, every time she talked about a piece, she had burst into tears. She said, and Warden made this in 1957. And they said, we just were tormenting this poor woman. We, we loved you know, the, the tour, we loved the place, but we thought we can't go back there and torture that poor woman again. So they said, we waited until we were sure we weren't gonna do that. So that, that speaks to, I think, her dedication to Wharton. She was very protective of the place. And isn't there a story that pe uh, somebody was showing people around and Wharton this and Wharton that, and then the, the, the visitor said, well, when are we going to meet the artist? Oh, he's been dead for years. <laughs> it yeah, was that yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. My, my grandparents were the Rubensons, and my grandmother was War Miriam's cousin. And this sort of says it all. I don't know if you can see this picture, but this is Rose and Nat and Miriam doing a jig at the Eschrick Museum in the parking lot, <laughs> which is sort of, sort of says it all. Like, that's crazy. Emily, I'll bring it over for the exhibit. But uh, anyway, they, that is, you know, we need to remember something. This is not a museum. There was a lot of love, laughter, drinking, parties, creativity. This guy's alive to this day, and, and we have to remember it's not some museum. This is made out of oak, and that's made out of walnut. This is like life itself. And Miriam really represented that in a lot of ways. One thing I found uh, up in the archives of the Hedgerow in Boston, uh, Miriam played the sort of administrative role for the theater. So she was often writing uh, letters for Jasper Dieter in the way that you were describing the ones that, you know, she wrote for Wharton, begging for money, asking for debts to be paid, um, trying to support them. And there were occasional, you know, copyright disputes and other kinds of things. And Miriam was always the one who was doing that, you know, from her early time at Hedgerow. So when she moved into Wharton, it was just a continuation of, of that process. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for for um, sharing those stories. And um, I'm so glad that you chimed in, Jeffrey, because it gives us a chance to mention also that when we open um, in the spring, we're going to have the original music stand that was designed uh, for Rose Rubinson on display in the visitor center, along with the wonderful um, exhibition that Emily is putting together that sort of looks at that one object as the kind of hub of many different stories and ways to think about Morton. And um, certainly certainly included in that is this very, you know, this zest for life and, and all of those qualities that you're talking about there. Well, and uh, part of the exhibit will be this very cute Wharton Eshry cartoon that he drew for my grandmother about how to correctly use the music stand. And I'll let you, all of you have your imagination engaged there, but it's very funny. Wonderful. Are there any other questions um, while we have Erin here today to think about the archives and some of the work that she did there? Um, it's worth highlighting that uh, she did create this wonderful finding aid um, that's available to researchers. And all of this is, you know, all of this work is so that more and more people can, can engage with these materials and, um, you know, kind of just carry his his legacy and his brilliance forward as we keep keep doing the work. I have a question, Erin, about how does how did this um, experience for you serve as a kind of building block in your own career? Like what are you doing now and what did sure. you take away from the experience at the museum? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm a recent graduate. I just got my master's degree in August um, in library science and archival studies. Um, I was able to do an internship at the Chester County History Center. Um, but this was my first real big uh, postgraduate project to work on. Um, so it was tremendous in my, in my career um, to be able to work hands on with a collection from start to bottom to finish something. Um, and, and the team was wonderful as well. You know, they kind of gave me the reins to, to do what I thought was good for the collection and for the museum, um, obviously with their approval, but I think this was, uh, you know, invaluable experience to, to just get under my belt and, but also, also fun too. The, the materials and, and Wharton and the, the whole museum as a place was just a really, really fantastic experience. So it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> Um, we had a question here too, um, if the finding aid is available on the website. I know that our um, the previous finding aid is up there, which includes the Warren Ashwick Museum family papers. Um, the finding aid that you developed, Erin, that is, at this point is just in a physical copy. Is that right? Um, at this point, there is a physical copy um, at the museum, but there's also, I know in our personal staff um, drive is all the materials for the, mm -hmm. for the collection. So I'm sure at some point, um, that'll find its way into the public, but there's a digital copy at the museum. There's a physical copy of the museum. At the, Great. At the right. Yeah. So if some, if researchers are interested, they can reach out to us and we can, sure. we can make that connection. Sure. Great. Other last comments or questions before we, we wrap up our talk for today? Um, I'll mention also that next uh, next month we are continuing and, and throughout 2023, we're continuing this theme of storytelling and really leaning into um, just what a, a wonderful kind of rich part of our Eshrick tradition storytelling is. Um, Holly Gore, who's on staff at WEM is going to be doing Wharton's Tilted Tales um, and bringing forward some of his own storytelling. So we'll hear um, some audio clips from our oral histories um, and some, you know, some stories from the artist himself. So that is going to be a lot of fun. We happen to schedule it on Valentine's Day. <laughs> so you should just come with your sweetheart. Hear some, hear some stories from Morton. It's going to be a blast. Um, and otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. Erin, thank you so, so much for the work that you did. Um, and, and the way that it set us up um, for so much more um, future research and, and way to share what we what we have. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us, everybody.